similar to the first lecture for this particular session, this lecture is a near complete version of a class that Dr. Clavel Hall recorded two years ago when she was teaching this course. At the time that she recorded it, the course was being taught over a 15-week period. So during that semester, in this particular week, the theme would have been organizational ready lists and translational models. And the students would have read Bronson at all chapters eight and nine, as well as White at all chapter eight. Now you'll notice what we've done this particular time is we've moved chapter eight of that into the readings with White et al. 4, 5, and 6, which the students in this particular semester would have read the previous week. So we're just moving essentially the organizational issues to follow in because it works kind of nicely, in my opinion, with chapter 6 of the White et al. textbook when they get into the issue of leadership. And you'll see in the latter parts of this particular lecture that Dr. Clavel Hall has provided for us that she also gets into the issue of leadership as well. So you should be able to see some of the thematic overlay with this. The first two thirds of this lecture where the focus is upon organizational culture and organizational readiness, I think are a really good primer for next week when we start looking at translational methods and in particular this idea of systems research or systems design or systems thinking. So hopefully that gives you a good introduction to what will be about the next 20 to 22 minutes that Dr. Clavel Hall has graciously provided for us. And this is what I tell you about as you're reading. I want you to question. I want you to look at other resources. I want you not just to take what you're reading at face value because most of us have an agenda when we're producing that information. But when you bring it together, what is it telling you? Okay, where do you stand with it? It may change your view on something, but we want to have it changed on credible evidence. Okay, and that's our new lens that we're trying to look at. So now, today, we're looking at organizational readiness and translational models. We have a few objectives here. We're going to look at culture a little bit, organizational culture and readiness. And when we look at uh, phases of implementation process, they're basically uh, looking at the exploration phase, the adoption and preparation phase, and the active implementation phase and sustainment. So we're on uh, Let's try Brownson, page 128, when we're looking at these different phases. <clears throat> okay, so you're starting to look at the readiness. So we're looking at the implementation phase. Say, uh, when we are looking at the implementation phase, and this is uh, with most of your projects, even though we're talking about implementation right now, we talk, they said they're talking about the exploration phase. And you said you're talking about the assessment phase. And Molly said the readiness phase. OK, so if we're looking at exploration and assessment, what, what, tell me a little bit more about why would you think assessment would be important at the beginning, not just of uh, the implementation phase, I'm thinking about your EBP projects. Would you think you would start at the same first step if in your implementation, I'm sorry, in your EBP project as you would in this implementation phase? You're telling me, okay, yeah, we have to do a needs assessment. So first off, put this on your, your calendar. Projects start with needs assessment. An official. Look here, you can go and find one online. You can look at some of the databases. You will start with a needs assessment, okay? And the reason is you will find yourself off at exits you didn't intend to. 
staying on highways longer than you should have, running out of gas. Mm. You have to have the plan. So the, the exploration period starts with the needs assessment. It can be called a clinical assessment. It can be called an environmental assessment. In the quality improvement uh, area, they call it the microsystem assessment, but you're at the systems level. So you want a needs assessment or an environmental assessment or a clinical assessment. You're gonna start there. And uh, then we have Miss uh, Miss Sharon here, who's like, okay, we did the needs assessment, but we've got three major problems. We've got, what is it you said? We've got liver transplant problems. We've got sick babies. Uh, and we have a, a building that's not seismically retrofitted. retrofitted or seismically adequate, okay? So we have earthquake risk. So that's what I found from the needs assessment. So, you know, that Jacqueline, she's telling me I need to do a needs assessment, but now look at what I've ended up with. Prioritizing. Had you not done the needs assessment, you might have chosen the one of these that's not going to give you the greatest bang for your buck. I might say, oh, earthquake. We've got to do earthquake because we've got to have a building that's uh, earthquake safe. But without doing the needs assessment, did you realize that they've already started building a new hospital that we'll be moving into in six months? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. stakeholders mm -hmm. and perspectives. Who, and when you do your projects, when you do a project, when you do a project at work, Mr. Implementation here, I'm pointing to John, when he does his projects, do you start with, we're going to do our implementation project for everybody. <laughs> handling, <laughs> handling the stakeholders, yeah. doing the priorities. Yes, we need to get something done, but we're gonna do it in this way because this, we have this particular set of stakeholders that we're working with. That's the kind of things that the needs assessment helps you with. What is the process? What, what's the problem that you're looking at? So the point is, you do the needs assessment before you develop the question, okay? This is the horse. We haven't gotten to the cart yet, okay? A lot of times people say, I'm just gonna do a, question, a project on falls. I like falls and we're dealing with falls at work. Your question should emanate from what the needs assessment told you. Okay, it should let you know where you're falling below benchmarks or where uh, the organization is interested in improving its scores, improving its uh, uh, length of stay, decreasing the length of stay. So my bottom line with this is your projects for your capstone, projects at work, if folks are asking you what's for dinner, think about a needs assessment. Start there. I know some people say, oh, I'm going to go to the literature first. Uh, you may go to the literature, and if the predominant uh, topic for the day or the year is X, that may steer you in a way that's not necessarily the one that that environment needs at that time. So then we looked at our implementation phases that we see here on page 128. And then we look at organizational culture. We look at the culture. And when I'm talking about organizational culture, this is everything from a large uh, multi-site multi, uh, health center to as little as a two-man clinic or two-woman clinic being run. They have their own culture. And it's the basic patterns and the attitudes and beliefs and values that people uh, base their uh, behavior on. And it provides stability and, and structure to that particular culture. The people know what to expect when they go in that environment. And it usually and should align with the goals and mission and value of the organization. 
And like here, the School of Nursing, we have our mission and values, which is, uh, and goals, which is based on the organization's mission and values. So what they're doing at the level that you are looking at should be based upon the goals and values of the higher institution or the system that it's a part of. And sometimes you look at culture and, and it's described as, this is the way we do things around here. And when you are the new kid on the block, new hire, and people tell you, this is how we do it, it's rare that you want to say, and not a good idea, this is how we did it at the place I came from. Not usually the best way to approach a new environment if you want to be a part of that environment. Um, I have to tell you, I have a friend who, uh, she's in Texas and she got a, a new job. She's been a, maybe a, what do you call it? A, a, a uh, auditor for many years. So she went to work for the state. And so she's in this collections department and they started her out in the back office and she's doing audits for the state. And then she went to the front desk. She said she had to work at the front desk. They sent her up and said, you'll be there for four weeks. Go ahead. And she came back to the person who sent her there. And she said, I'm at the front desk, but there's no chair. And she says, the woman told her, you have to take your chair from the back office and take it to the front office. And my, otherwise there's no chair for you and you're working there eight hours at the front desk where the customer is. And so the point was, she said, that makes no sense. And I wanted to say, you know, just get a chair and have it at the front desk. But because of the culture, not a good idea for you to come as the newbie on the block and tell them how, senseless what they were doing was. So what did she do? She got her chair and she saw that the other person had her name on the back of her chair on a piece of tape and she put her name on the back of the chair and she said, I can't tell you how silly I felt doing it, but she was trying to fit into the culture. Does it make sense? Not at all. But that's what culture will do. Culture is constrained by types of behavior that are not explainable. So an organization is what it is, how they do things, and it's also what it has, how much resources it has, how much clout it has in the community, how much political influence it has, that makes up organizational culture. And we look here and see that it's sometimes defined as that which is learned by the members, and it's what they use to help solve the external problems that they have and it's things that work for them. Some uh, organizations have a tough culture where if you're gonna work here, you know, you, you, you better just put on your big girl panties and, and keep it moving. And if that's the culture, that's what you tend to try to do. If everybody else is being tough, let me at least try to be tough. It's what they do to survive. It's not always what it is that makes sense. So they use that. It's also, it's what works well enough to be taught to new people. You're new. You need to go get your chair from the back. That's, that's what we're teaching you to do. And you would think those that are in the culture would be better at knowing what's to be, what needs to be improved. But then you get to that hierarchical nature of who can tell whom what to do or who can not even tell you what to do, who can speak out about things that don't make sense. Do you think it would have went over very well if my friend who's been there, what, two months, tells people about, you know, the, what is it, lack of common sense about something silly like dragging a chair? Yeah, the silliness of it, but yes, uh, cultures are in organizations not always helpful and the constraints on the culture sometimes hampers people bringing out things that should be brought out. So then you have organizational climate. And when we look at the organizational climate, uh, there's something called the molar climate and the strategic climate. Looking at the molar or the generic climate looks at um, measuring the climate at the broad levels across multiple dimensions. And it's looking at the organizational culture. Uh, it helps with um, 
the clinical outcomes when you're looking at the generic climate. When you look at the strategic climate, it's trying to understand the extent to which the employees perceive the management it is uh, emphasizing how much the management really cares about what's going on in the organization. Now, this is interesting because it's rare that you think about the climate in an organization as where do the employees stand? It's usually about the CFO, the CNO, the CEO, where they are. But these uh, measures actually look at those people who are working at the front lines, okay? And dissemination and implementation research is big on trying to find out what's going on with those who actually have to use and implement the interventions that we're sending down, okay? If you're not paying them any attention, you may be missing a very important stakeholder view. So, so I, I think a, a couple of things that having those options, some of that will go to the leadership and we'll get to that in a, in a minute here, the types of leadership we'll look at. And um, as you look at that, I just want to put a pin in it. Uh, what kind of hospital do you work at? And I think that makes a difference in the approach. Which type of, uh, which team would you rather be on here? If you're in healthcare, if you've got high levels of potential risk. So we're looking at types of leadership to figure out the types of outcomes we're looking at. And for this, we'll end, probably end up with some of this, but looking at the full range of leadership uh, as organizational leadership styles definitely impact outcomes, definitely impact the quadruple aim. And uh, Jeremy, you mentioned something about, well, there was a time they would just tell you what to do and you did it. And as long as they were paying you, you weren't asking too many questions. You were just doing what they say. And you even get to a point of who's they, you know, but that's what they said. So, and that's what they gave us. So this is what we'll use. So as you look at transactional leadership, you see that based on contracts and transactions and I pay you, you do what I say. Okay. And you don't do what I say, and then what happens in the old days, pre-magnet? And even if they didn't put you all the way out, sometimes you were socially ostracized, mm -hmm. you know, because if I deal with you and you're not following the rules, you might get me in trouble, and, you know, I don't want to be seen in a bad light. So that was the top-down approach. And then we have transformational leadership. And we're looking at transformational leadership with the four eyes. We'll look at that in a minute. And it's uh, being an example. It's motivating people, giving them what they need, and having better outcomes from it. Now, let's look at laissez-faire. That sounds kind of fun. But is that the kind of job that you want to work under and leadership that you want to work under in a high-risk industry? So now we look at some of the four eyes of transformational leadership, meaning it's individualized consideration. You're looking at people individually. This is what the transformational leader does. Uh, they are challenging assumptions, but also supporting you, stimulating you into thinking. I know some nights you walk out of here and go, what is she talking about? You know, she, she's just getting on my nerves. But when you think about it, sometimes things will begin to come together for you. Looking at articulating the vision as a whole and being uh, a role model. Organizational readiness, the extent to which the organization members are psychologically and behaviorally prepared to implement a new innovation or technology. And you, really need to understand that this is essential that they be ready psychologically and behaviorally. And the last thing I'll say is look at the Kurt Lewin change model. Do you remember reading about that? Very, very important. It was actually at that point that Dr. Clavel Hall had 
uh, had a break during the class and then um, the recording ends at that stage. The Lewin model that she's talking about is on page 129 of the Bronson et al. textbook. You can see it there. It starts in the section beginning organizational readiness for change and you can see the three-stage model that Lewin talks about there um, beginning I guess in the second sentence of that paragraph or that section to be honest with you. The only thing that was left in the PowerPoint that Dr. Clavo Hall didn't capture in the recording was actually once again the summary. And when you look at this particular chapter, there were sort of two main things that you should take away from it. The first was that there are a whole variety of factors that impact the ability to do translational research or evidence-based practice in any healthcare setting. And the more diverse the setting, the more diverse the organization or the context, and by diverse I mean from a structural standpoint as well as from a, a unit standpoint to a human resources standpoint. Um, the more diverse the organization, the, the, um, the more complex the factors that uh, influence your ability to do this. The other thing is that um, when you're looking at trying to in enact translational research or evidence-based practice into an organization, the culture or readiness of that organization can in some cases be a barrier and in some cases can help facilitate that process. And it's not going to be an all or nothing thing. So the nature of the culture and readiness of the organization isn't going to be a 100% barrier. Hopefully won't be a 100% barrier. Similarly, it's not going to be 100% in a position to help facilitate that. There's going to be aspects of both that um, are going to play into your ability to enact a translational research project or an evidence-based practice project. And those things are things that you'll likely pull out as part of your needs assessment when you're looking at the organization, a sense as to how ready the organization is to be able to do this and whether or not the culture is going to allow or impede that particular involvement. So that takes us to the end of the content in the two textbooks. Um, one of the things I will mention is that these sections that we've looked at this week, and for that matter that we will look at next week, were actually sort of combined together in previous versions of this course that have been offered over a 15-week period the students would spend three weeks looking at the topics that we are essentially spending two weeks looking at now because of our condensed format. So there's going to be some overlap between the types of things that you're seeing this week and next week. Um, and hopefully these will inform each other as you start to move into next week and specifically start to get into the notion of systems thinking, which is really the theme for next week's activities.